It's an honor for me to be here this morning, Pastor Gordon, as the apostolic leader that he is. He was asked to speak at Pastor John Dunn's church as his spiritual father, which I thought was so cool. So this morning, I'm going to encourage you with what I believe this world needs. It's not going to be a lengthy message, only about two and a half hours, so cancel your reservations. But the, really, the Father just had me go down and talk about His love. Because some of these young men that were standing up, I don't know where their walk is, but I know they're called. I know my biggest struggle, having kids, and I love to see my girls here and plugged into the church, but I never had that. So going, how do I know how to raise children in a Christian environment? I don't, but I know who does. And so I had to lean on what the scripture says about how to love. I've shared this story before. I remember my oldest who was up here singing, Mallory. That's my oldest daughter. She came in to me and she was little bitty. She came in into my bedroom and she looked at me and I'm like, what is wrong with her? Did she stay up too late? I don't know what's wrong. My daughter, my wife looked over. She said, she wants you to tell her she looks beautiful. At that moment, I knew I was done. But I had to realize I had to learn to love unconditionally. I am blessed to still have my earthly father here. He, he did the best that he still. It's amazing when you get older, you realize how wise your dad actually is. But now I cherish the time that we can, I can spend with him. Because there was a moment in my life where, man, he, he drove me for, for excellence. And what he drove me for excellence, I, I kind of rebelled. I know no one else did that. But years later, he wrote me a letter. He said, son, I'm so proud of you. I lost my dad when I was a teenager. So I never knew how to raise a son. It broke me because I re realized I was holding him to a, a place that was unfair because he didn't know what he didn't know. But this morning, I want to share with you some scriptures that should encourage you. And this is, this is not just for the males in the house, the fathers, but I want to encourage the ladies that this, his father's love is not gender specific. That we have our roles. That yes, men, we are the priests for our home, but our job as a priest is to serve our wives. And if anybody knows my wife, she leads right alongside of me. Amen. Learning our roles. The news, the, the identity crisis we have in the United States. I believe we can fix that. I mean, I believe that. See, I believe the reason why we have identity crisis because some of the key things in the scriptures that we have forgotten to teach, the simplicity of the word of God. We don't have to be deep theologians and, and go into breaking down, and I do love to go into break down the, the, the word of God into some specific, but sometimes we, we have a world that needs to just know the simplicity of the God. Because the problem is, when we get past certain scriptures, when people start asking us questions, we're like, I don't know. I remember I was talking to a doctor who, who works up in Seattle, and very brilliant. He's an atheist. This is at a Christmas party. Go figure that one out. But he said, oh, you're a pastor. Great. And I'm sitting there going, well, my Christmas party is over. And the whole time he was just asking me questions and the whole conversation I had is God's love. So he said at the end, because I learned that he was an altar boy and that what he saw in the church disturbed him and pushed him away from the word of God. And I said, well, I'm sorry for what happened, but this is who God is. He said, wow, you've made it simple. He said, this is the best conversation I've had. 
I'm sitting in my mind going, well, this is terrible. But anyway, but it opened the door for him to see God truly like we should reflect. Amen? Father, I pray that this morning that everything I say and do will glorify you. Father, open up the hearts of your people to hear your word, not just in, in this house, but watching online. Amen? All right. I want to thank you all for, for those who know where my wife and I were traveling for Europe and suffering for the Lord for a couple of weeks. Um, I would encourage you to take time away. You know, to, to see the world and, and to see how honored we are. She, I love this, the worship song that we're singing about his goodness. Sometimes we get so caught up in the day and things that stumble us up that we forget how blessed we are. We are blessed to just to live in the United States. If you've ever traveled outside, and here's the deal, the places my wife and I traveled to were phenomenal, beautiful. But I was reading some statistics on the plane that, that these, if, if you were a one percenter in this world, you make $35,000 a year. 35000 We're blessed. But I saw this inscription when we were traveling, and it really um, hit home for me about Father's Day. It said, why should men work if not for their children and wives? Think about that. Men are so driven for success and for providing, which is honorable, and we want to do that. But for what reason? See, my, my job as a father, just like our Heavenly Father, is to see us succeed. He's not there with a big hammer going, hey, I'm wondering, oh, look at Pastor Mark. Thump. He's not going to do that. It's not gonna, it's, that's not what he is. He's, he's your biggest cheerleader. But it doesn't mean he doesn't discipline us. Let's read 1 John 3.1. I'm just going to read the first part. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. Simple. Well, that's not very too complicated for us to understand, but then why don't we grasp that? If we are all called, my first point is that we're all called his children. That means all races, all age, rich, homeless, Rich and homeless. It doesn't matter who you are. Saved. Unsaved. We are all called his children. So think about this. If we, if we all understood that and we reflect that and we communicated that to everyone we know, would we have an identity issue here? If, if we're sitting there going, and there's been times that I battled depression myself. Then I sat there and go, oh. And it was a moment, it got time and season in my life where I was like, oh, I, I'm not measuring up. I'm not doing this. I'm not six. If I would remember that I'm his son, called to do his work, that we would not judge by the color of our skin. We would not judge, oh, they're too young. They're too old. As long as we have breath in our body, we have a purpose and a calling. See, my, my dad is 83 years old. They still hold hands when they go walking. Now, did, was I raised in a Christian home? No. But did they teach me things? Yes. But he still has breath in his body. So I believe in complete salvation and restoration. And I believe that for those that aren't sitting here today. But we have to reflect that. In society, we, we look at those that are rich as more important than those that are homeless. 
I'm not throwing stones this morning. I believe those, and here's the deal, it's not, it's not the, the, the wealth or the riches, it's the love of money. My question is, if God has blessed you, are you a blessing to others? If God has given you those resources to be a blessing, are you keeping them to buy all kinds of stuff that you really don't need and you can't take with you? Now, I like nice things, so don't, you know what I mean, the extravagance. Do we love the lost as much as we love the saved? We have an opportunity of praying this morning with our team out front, and they were giving us a testimony on, on them feeding close to 60 families, 70 families, I believe. Is that right? 70 people. God's children that we're taking care of. Amen? Loving those, our brothers and sisters, serving those. As Christians, we must step into the full understanding of this, living our lives, understanding that we need to love others like Christ loves us. The scripture says, lavish love. My father kind of makes fun of me sometimes because he said, you're spoiling your, go- your daughters. Yes, I do. Lavish love. Is that your view of your heavenly father? Lavish. His goodness. Are we fathering others the same way the father loves us? Just a question. You could be like, yes, Pastor David, man, I am uh, everyone I meet. There's people that I, I, people that tailgate me, people that, there's sometimes I'm like, whoo, Father, love them. Listen, we're, we're, we're all a work in progress. So I'm not here throwing stones. Listen, guess who wrote this message? Me. Why? Because I, I need to, there's, there's things and people that, that, that is inside of me that I'm asking Father to, to, to shore up. Some judgmental things that I have, things that I'm like, Father, I'm not really, I'm not there yet. Help me. And this one I realized a few weeks ago that I, I didn't realize was in me, but, uh, Tom, who's over here, kind of helped me with this one. Let's read Matthew 18, 12 through 14. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hill and go look for the one who's wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your heavenly Father is not willing, not willing to have any of these should perish. Second point, he leaves the 99. See, a few weeks ago, I was, my family has a ranch in Waco, and we happen to have not sheep, but we have goats. I don't really like goats. We have too many goats. And I, there was one morning I was out, and, and Tom and Pastor Robert with, with me, and I'm sitting there, and I have my worship music on. I'm, I have my little lawnmower. My neighbor stops me and says, hey, two of your goats are out. My first reaction was like, praise God. <laughs> Seriously, it was like, and these goats are looking at him. I look back, I said, I got, I got plenty of them. And I was going to sell half of them anyway. So I'm, in my mind, I'm rationalized going, do I, here I am listening to worship music, zoning out. I think Tom is reading, and, and I, I'm sitting there going, I really, in my mind, was like, I put my headphones back on, and I kept mowing. And immediately I got convicted, and I thought about this scripture. He said, Are you, would you leave 
I said, well, God, these aren't sheep. These are goats. <laughs> There's a difference. Between, and I'm, I'm, here I am trying to negotiate with God going, wait a minute. Do you realize how... <sighs> And through this process, Father showed me some things that I needed to shore up. See, in, when this happened to me, it was at the most inconvenient time. And it's going to happen to you the same way. Man, is it inconvenient to... Well, listen, I got all my, all my friends together. I got, man, this is my group. This is my covenant group. This is my small group. What I'm wondering is, like, well, yeah, but they'll be okay. They're God's children. God loves them. Do I really want to stop the barbecue to go over there? And I even, it was funny because I told Tom, I was like, you know what? I'm teaching about this in a few weeks. And it really did something to me that I had to remember that God revealed this for a reason because there's things in me then I'm like, hey, listen, a 99, 99 is pretty good. That's an A. I mean, anybody been in school, I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm good. I was a solid C student, so I'm like, hey, I'm good. Well, it's funny because then Tom came to me and we were like, listen, how do these, how do I get these back in? I, I want you to think about this. The lost sometimes do not know how to get back. Because these two goats, one of them was a black one, one of them was a white one, they stood at the fence and started just hollering at me, which made me even further going, Psht. cabrito for lunch. I'm like, no. And literally, they didn't know how to come back. How many of our brothers and sisters have messed up, have wandered away, and they don't know how to come back? Or they feel like, listen, um, the things that I've done, I can't come back. See, I, I know friends and pastors of mine over the years that have made some really bad mistakes, but it doesn't change the fact that God loves them. And there's been times in my life where that judgmental spirit came on. Well, they deserve that. That's exactly what I was thinking about these ghosts. They deserve to be over there. I spent a week shoring up that fence. How'd they get out? But then, every place that I walked, they were standing there, at, I started walking down the fence line, and they started to follow me. I said, ah, so our job is to lead them back. But sometimes it can take help, because Tom actually had to go to the front gate and open up the front gate, because as I was walking, I said, I have no idea how to get them back here. Listen, lean on your brothers. If there's one lost... You don't know how to do it. Lean on your brothers. Hey, let's pray for so-and-so. Let's, let's get them back. I know they fell. I know they messed up, but they're still our brothers. How many of are willing to do that? And the funny thing is, as we're doing that, man, we, we cross in the front of the ranch, and all of a sudden, some knucklehead pulls up with his car. He was running the wrong way. There's going to be distractions. It's going to be hard. It's going to be uncomfortable. But we have to show them the way. And then here's the thing. We open up the gate and they just trot in like nothing happened. Goat. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to leave the 99, leave your comfort zone to go out and sign up to volunteer feeding meals to the homeless? Are you willing to travel to a country to minister God's love to those who need it? Our interns just got back from Nicaragua last night, ministering, loving on kids, the elderly. Maybe God's called you. Well, I can't. No, you won't. It's a difference. Shepherds love their, che their sheep. He cares for them. He wants to protect them. He wants to keep them safe. 
Do you notice in this scripture, the father knew that one was missing. He knows them by name. That's how important that one is. Now, it doesn't mean that if you, and some of us have been that 99 and came back, well, look at, man, I had a hard road back. It was tough. Yes. Listen, I'm not saying that there's a scripture I'm going to read in Hebrews that talks about why he disciplines us. And the meaning of discipline isn't punishment. The meaning of discipline is actually out of love. You don't love, you don't discipline anybody you don't love. Let's read what Hebrews says. Hebrews 12, 10. Our Father disciplines us for a little while as though it's the best, but God disciplines us for good. That we may share in his what? Holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. A lot of us say amen. But painful, but later on, however, it produces what? A harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained. See, a lot of us, and I think it is a cultural thing as, as fathers, even as mothers, we, we want to be our children's friends. I want everybody to like me. Go sell ice cream. I would rather my children not like me for a moment and their lives be changed. My daughters are, are here, and trust me, there's times that I have messed up. And it's, it's usually not by saying things. It's usually by giving, giving them a look or an attitude. But I see my children, I try to see my children the way that God sees them and me tr trying to keep them on path. Fathers, I want to encourage you. You are the spiritual head of the home. Sometimes you're not going to be their best friend. We have a lot of those 1%, the, the one that's walked away. My challenge to you is let's find that one. Let's ask the Father, are we bold enough to even ask the Father, Father, show us the one that I can go save. But understand what you're asking for. You're asking to get out of your comfort zone, to say, Father, I'm willing to do, I'm willing to pray for them, I'm willing to eat, intercede for them. See, there's over two billion people who identify as Christians. Two billion so my question is, why are we having so much problems in society? I've sat on this point a while because I believe, again, as I talked about, that we have an identity issue because we don't understand who we are. That he is willing to leave the entire flock to bring one back. But some of us aren't willing to do the same. See, I, working with children and working with youth, it bothers me when I hear statistics about suicide and depression and, listen, we live in a fallen world. And I, I was going through my notes and I had a friend of mine, that close friend, passed away through suicide. And he was battling himself. He's like, Did, why do you think that happened? I said, I don't know why these things happen. But don't be, ever, when, and so his whole mission now was to save those that are dealing with, in, that are in crisis. And his one purpose is, is to show them that they are God's children. And as his children, he wants to, as we said earlier, lavish on us, give us gifts, anoint us, empower us. Let's read Matthew 7, 9 through 11. Which of you, if your sons ask for bread, he will give you a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will give them a snake? 
If you then are being human, one translation says evil, because we are fallen, know how to good give gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give you gifts for those who ask? Third point, he gives us good gifts. Our heavenly Father is so good, he loves us. He's our biggest cheerleader. As I said earlier, he's not there to thump us. Listen, some of us say, well, I want to have... Understand the gifts that I'm talking about is not material gifts. It could be. What are you asking for? See, the next scripture I'm going to read that he, he knows our thoughts before we even say them. He knows us. Sometimes we're just not asking. Father, I just ask you to, to show me things on how to raise my daughters. That's what I did. They would come to me with all these emotions and tears, and they're perfect now. But I, I still at times scratch my head going, how much hormones can I actually have in the house? And, and I, this is a conversation I have with the father. I said, father, really give me wisdom. Because sometimes as parents, we, we decide not to grow with our children. See, I, I'm, I'm good. I know how to parent a five-year-old. Why? Because they've been that way. But how do I know how to parent a 20-year-old? How do I know how to parent a 27-year-old or a 17-year-old and two female dogs and a wife? Anyway, <laughs> you can say a lot of time praying, but it, it's it, because I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes guys, we, it's okay, and, and women, it's okay for us. To, I, I don't know what I'm doing. And God's, God looks down and says, yeah, I can see that. Why did you do that? Ah, uh-huh. let, let me show you. Let me show you. And see, for, for us, we, we did things, and, and here's the thing. As parents, don't compare your, how you parent with anybody else. Why? Because their kids are different than your kids. What I did with my kids, and people would look and go, how did you do that? They're my kids. Now, I, I want to encourage you that to, to be an avid learner, we, wrote, we read so many books on how to be parents and realized those are written for those kids. But we did learn when we were the children's pastor going, I'm not doing that. But we have to remember who their heavenly father is. See, I, I'm just trusted with raising he, them here on this earth. So I said, Father, give me the gift of understanding, patience, patience. And guess what? He's going to give me challenge times that I have to learn patience. My daughter came, uh, came home. This was a couple of years ago. I'm not going to tell you which one. You'll figure it out. And she was driving her, her car, and she said, Dad, I hit a rock. And I'm like, hit a rock? I said, well, that's great. You got a little SUV. Perfect. So you ran over it. Well, I go out to her car and her whole bumper is smashed. I said, technically, that was true. But I'm thinking rock, not a boulder. And I, and I sat there and went, <sighs> and I actually started laughing going, that is a rock. And that was probably something that I said to my dad too. But the reason why I said it is because I was afraid of the consequences. And, I, and immediately I sat there and went, wow, I need, to, I need to ask Father for something else. Have I got there yet? No. Because as they grow, I grow. And I'm asking Father to show me, a, give me a gift, a new vision, how to raise my family, to be an influence a greater influence. And here's the, here's the kind of the statement that I've, I've adapted for my life. And it's not monetary. But I'm blessed to be a blessing. That everything that I, I, I do, everything that I say, everything that I want to do in my life, I understand that I'm blessed. Why? 
to be a blessing to others. My whole purpose is to serve others. And whatever that is, and that's me, but find something for you that you can stand on because there's times that you're like, am I going to bless others or am I just going to keep this for myself? And it is now turned into, I can't wait to bless people. And in turn, guess what? I'm blessed. Let's read Matthew 6 through 9. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. For they think they, they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask. I think this is a stumbling block for a lot of us because for Lee, who wasn't raised in church, going, ah, oh, I'm, I'm not like Pastor Mark or the other pastor who weren't raised in church, that, that man, I didn't get saved until I was older. How, how can I? He knows already. That we want to sound like we're so smart, and sometimes the father just says, hey, listen, I, pretty know, I know. But why is that important? Because our words activate life. So it's important for us to say, you know what, God, just bless. Bless Don for his faithfulness. It doesn't mean we don't pray. It's the opposite. It means we pray more. Our words have power to bring life or death. The scripture says a threefold cord is not easily broken. Let's pray with our brothers and sisters. We prayed before service start. We're praying in the green room for each one of you. He knows and he's waiting to release it. A lot of times he's sitting there going, come on, I know what you're going through. Ask. Healing, ask. Restoration, come on, speak it. And and he'll just lose angels going, yes, finally he's asked. We need to be church that, that prays together, intercedes together, If we understand praying is just his desire to talk to us, for him to remind us that he is our Abba, he's our daddy. First Corinthians 14, 2 Corinthians 14.2 For one who speaks in a tongue that does not speak to men but to God. For no one understands, but the Spirit speaks mysteries. Ephesians 6.19, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the what? Spirit. See, understanding that God has given us not just our earthly prayer, but a spiritual prayer language. Not to get caught up on that, that's a gift. But the scripture says we, we do not know what to pray. As a children's pastor for years, I was like, ah. I remember putting in the first situation where I had no idea what to pray. I was, uh, had to do my first memorial for a child that passed away. I tell you what, that was a, a time for me. I was probably 30 years old, and they were like, listen, we need you to perform a memorial for a six-year-old. And I'm like, well, I quit. Because what do you do? And I remember at that, at that moment, the Father spoke to me and reminded me of the scripture, when you do not know what to pray, pray in the Spirit. And so at the memorial, as a, as a young pastor, and everybody's around, it was at the, at the uh, burial site. I think they expected me to have some deep revelation and how to bring healing. And I said, can't we just stop? Because they were all spirit-filled believers. I said, let's just pray in the Spirit. And what broke out of that time was healing and tears and revelation for them and what was needed. Let's read John 14, 15. I've talked a lot about Father's love, and it says, If you love me, men, women, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you an advocate, 
that will help you. It will be with you forever. The Holy Spirit of truth. If you love me, if you love me. See, if it, it's, it's in there because do, do you really understand that you have a choice to love him? See, the Holy Spirit is here to empower us, to guide us. And I'm not going to read the next point, because it, but it says that our spirit, the Holy Spirit links with our spirit to carry us on this walk. That we need to pray, said, Father, let your Holy Spirit guide me into a place that you want me to be in. And if you're so bold, Father, let me be used to be your mouthpiece in a broken society. Father, use me to raise up godly men to be spiritual fathers of their home. But remember what you're asking for. And I want to close with the most recited, famous scripture in the Bible. My last point is his love is sacrificial. And if we are supposed to reflect Christ now, it's to the point where God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Now, I, I believe God's not asking us to do that, but he's showing us that he loves us so much. What else is there? What, what God, uh, you know what it's going to take me to, to like, I have my golf, like, I got golf on Saturdays. Do I really want to go to feed the homeless? Sorry, Rosie, just had to throw that out. But what, what are you, or what you, aren't you willing to sacrifice? That whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him, this is the Great Commission. Our, our job as fathers, understanding his love, is to reach out for those that need to hear him. This true, sacrificial, unconditional love. See, some of us Christians, it's, we, we, we see this as a goal. No, salvation is not a goal to achieve, but a gift to receive. It's something that, that should be the start of our journey, not the end. And men, it's something that you don't have to strive for, but it's already been paid for. But you just have to say, listen, there's no way, I've, I, can, I can't measure up, yes. Men, slow down. We, we live in a society that, we, that we've, including myself, that we, we strive for success. Listen, God already accepts you and women. You're his sons and daughters. Paul said this, I am afraid of one thing, that you get away from the simplicity of the devotion of Christ. Think about this, Paul. He was afraid of one thing, that we've made things too complicated. That we simply need to be devoted to Christ and understand that we are his sons and daughters, that we are called and appointed in this life to be his reflection. We can argue about a lot of things. In the body of Christ is divided because we are we baptize him in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or in Jesus' name. Listen, let's go back to the simplicity, devotion of God. We are his sons and daughters. 
Listen, I know they're a big thing to a lot of people, and I'm not minimizing that. But I, I want us to, I believe we're losing a world because the church is not unified. That, that every scripture I gave you this morning shouldn't be divisive. It should be we all stand together regardless if we're Baptist, Pentecostal, wherever you stand, that we should understand that God sent his only son to be an example of how we need to live sacrificial lives. Slow down. We're too busy. Your job, your marriage, your kids, soccer, dance, volleyball, golf, and that's all in one week. Your job is not to be a chauffeur. Your job is to love God and to love others. I'm going to ask everybody just to bow their head and close their eyes. I'm going to ask you two things. As I was preparing this message a couple days ago, I really felt that there's, there's some, if you're watching online, that may be here that have been battling with depression. And when no one else looking, I want you to look at me. Thank you. Thank you. This message is for you. Because you don't have to achieve anything else for God to love you the way you are. You don't have to look a certain way. You don't have to talk a certain way. You don't have to be saved a certain amount of years. God loves you. It knows where you're at. The second thing I'm going to ask is for those who are watching online and those who are in the house here, I'm going to challenge you to, to step up into this role to understand how loved you are, that your love has to be a vessel, has to be you have to be a vessel of love. That should be a funnel. That if there's things in your life that you need to shore up, that going, listen, I'm too judgmental, I'm too whatever it is, you fill in the gaps. My challenge is, are you reflecting his love to the one lost? I want to challenge you. And if you're here this morning and you don't know the Father the way that I described this morning, that you've never asked Jesus in your heart as your Lord and Savior, I just want you to raise your hand. Thank you. So we understand that one salvation, the one. One is worth the whole world and everything in it. That's how valued you are. And so this message may just be for you, but it's worth it. Father, this asks you to bless your fathers today. Father, I just thank you for who you are. And I pray that we reflect your image on this Father's Day and not just this day, but the rest of our lives.